Good afternoon, and welcome to today's IAC webinar, LAA Closure, Addressing the Unmet Needs for AF Patients. My name is Kelly Baer, and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who'd like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There, you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASRT CE credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and Heart Rhythm Society. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Walid Saliba. Dr. Saliba is the director of the EP Lab and director of the Atrial Fibrillation Center at the Cleveland Clinic, a true expert in the field, and we are happy to have him with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. Walid Saliba. Dr. Saliba? Good afternoon, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to present uh, about the left atrial appendage uh, closure, which has been a newer technology and has uh, grown significantly over the past uh, several years. So what I decide I would do is start with uh, really the rationale and basic information. Where did we come to this point? And then uh, probably discuss some of the ongoing findings and uh, results of uh, clinical trials. Um, and then end with where the research is going and what do we expect with this kind of technology to go. So with this in mind, I would start with first a typical case that we see in our clinic. This is a 76-year-old female patient, non-hypertensive and diabetic, has had a prior history of DIA, so obviously higher risk kind of patient. She has had permanent atrial fibrillation with controlled ventricular rate and has failed prior antiarrhythmic medication. She has had poor compliance with medications. When she was on warfarin, her INR would go up to four. She would have some GI bleeding, sometimes requiring transfusion. Her heart uh, substrate is significant for a normal EF. She has a large left atrium by echo. And she has been off oral anticoagulation for the past four months because of her history of bleeding. And the question is, when we see a patient like this, what do we do next? So whenever we treat uh, atrial fibrillation and discuss this treatment with our patients, there are four things that come to, uh, uh, to mind. First, that we have to control their rate. Second, that we have to see what are the strategies to control their uh, atrial fibrillation, including antiarrhythmic medication or ablation. But most importantly is the stroke prevention strategies that we discuss with them. And the newer guidelines, as you know, call for oral anticoagulation for patients at high risk as judged by their chads vas score of two or more. And the strategies that we have available for stroke prevention at this point in time are the traditional warfarin, the newer oral anticoagulants, uh, so far now they're not new anymore, but these are the newest one we have available. And by most recent guidelines, these are favored over warfarin. And now more recently, the issue of left atrial appendage exclusion, be it surgical or percutaneous exclusion. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, 
And what is the rationale behind it? Well, we know that patients who are at high risk for stroke in the setting of oral atrial fibrillation, not all of them receive oral anticoagulation for various reasons, all of this, be it from their physician not giving it to them or afraid of bleeding. Well, 50% almost of them do not receive oral anticoagulation. And even if they take it and are prescribed this medication, almost a third of them will stop taking it uh, for some reason or another by two years. And if they decide that they want to take it, they're there is a compounding risk of bleeding over the years that averages around 2% on a yearly basis. And we know that in atrial fibrillation, 90% uh, of the clots or of the uh, the strokes that happen in atrial fibrillation are because of uh, clots that form within the left atrial appendage. And therefore, since we have a problem with oral anticoagulation medication, and since we know where clots, most of the clots in atrial fibrillation come from, then maybe a left atrial appendage occlusion strategy can confer the same stroke prevention benefit without the ongoing risk of bleeding and the problems with compliance with oral anticoagulants. And the way we can actually occlude or exclude the left atrial appendage, the surgeons have looked at this for a long period of time, but unfortunately, we do not have good data to tell us that that strategy, at least from the surgical standpoint, is adequate. The data from the surgical standpoint is limited. There are no formal randomized clinical trials. Now they are being done. And there's little agreement as to how do you surgically close the left atrial appendage? Do you clip it? Do you sew it? Do you remove it? So therefore, we do not know exactly what is the best strategy from the surgical standpoint, especially that some of those strategies tend to become um, the, the left atrial appendage uh, failed the surgical closure in most of these patients uh, uh, using this kind of a technique. To that end, we have several now percutaneous ways to close the left atrial appendage with various uh, devices that are uh, being developed or that have been developed. What I'm going to talk about is specifically the Watchman device because it's the only device that is approved in the USA for use in patients with atrial fibrillation at high risk of stroke. But there are other device formulations that are being currently studied in the US as well as in Europe that we will see a lot of promising results uh, down the road. The procedure is uh, in a way fairly simple. It's a percutaneous procedure via femoral stick. We go all the way transeptal to access the left atrial Atrium. And then once we're there, we take an appendageogram, such as you can see here, a die shot of the appendage to kind of understand the anatomy of the left atrial appendage. We usually have a TEE that can actually uh, tell us the status of the left atrial appendage. Is there a clot? Is there, uh, what is the anatomy? We take some baseline measurements to size the appendage, such as the os and the depth of the appendage. Then we take the uh, device and deploy it. You can see it here at the tip of the red arrow in the left atrial appendage. And then we look to make sure by TEE that the device is well seated, that there are no leaks around the device, that the device is well compressed. And if we're happy with the real results, then we kind of release it. And that's the end of the procedure. It doesn't take more than half an hour, uh, really, once you have access to complete the, the procedure um, uh, completely. Once the device is implanted, the patient has to be on oral anticoagulation plus aspirin for a period of 45 days. We are talking specifically about the watchman because other devices might have a different post-drug regimen. Um, and after 45 days, a TE is done to confirm that there are no clots on the device, that the device is well seated without any leaks. And if this is the case, the patient switches to Plavix and aspirin for a period of six months. And after that, it would be aspirin indefinitely with the rationale that by that time, there has been adequate endothelialization of the device and therefore the risk of clot formation on top of the device is relatively small. Now, because there are several variations in the anatomy of the left atrial appendage, as well as the os of the left atrial appendage, those devices have variable sizes. And sometimes you can favor a device uh, one device from a, one company over a different uh, device uh, just because of how the, the appendage looks like and uh, what device will fit that appendage in a better formation.
Now, with the Watchman device, and so over the past several years, there has been several randomized clinical trials, predominantly, and I'm sure you're aware of it, the Protect AFib and the Prevail study, as well as their continued access protocols uh, uh, studies that enrolled several uh, patients, and now we have follow-up on more than 6,000 patient years, that all these studies in totality have shown that Watchman device, when compared to warfarin, is associated with a 55% reduction in disabling strokes, is associated with a 27% reduction in all-cause mortality. And when you think about it is, why is it that a device that you put in the left atrial appendage should reduce the mortality, while that reduction in mortality is predominantly driven by a reduction in hemorrhagic stroke and a reduction in major non-procedural bleeding. This decrease in bleeding is because patients are not taking oral anticoagulants over that period of follow-up, and that is probably what makes the difference in terms of mortality in patients who get the device uh, placed in the left atrial appendage. So, with this in mind, and whenever we have a new device that is on the market, you kind of wonder, okay, well, how successful are we in putting this device in? All the studies have shown that the implant success is more than 95%, and actually with the newer version of the Watchman, which is the Watchman Flex, it's up to 99% uh, implant success. And the safety of putting that device, which means what are the problems that we can run into around the time of the procedure, such as pericardial effusion, risk of perforation, device embolization, risk of stroke at the time of the procedure. These have come down significantly from around 4% down to most recently with the Watchman Flex device, 0.5%. And it has to do with gaining experience among operators, as well as getting um, better devices, uh, such as I will discuss with you with the new uh, device uh, that is currently available. So it is effective implant. It is fairly safety, from the safety standpoint, fairly safe to do these kinds of uh, procedure. Now, there are certain issues that we need to be aware of on longer term follow up, such as, well, what if we see leaks around the device and what is the incidence of a leak and what does it mean? Well, it turned out that if the leak is less than five millimeter in diameter at the time of the TEE at 45 days, then that is not a big problem. If it is more than five millimeter, it might have some implications and patient might continue to uh, on oral anticoagulation. And there are now centers who, if they find a leak, they try to coil the, uh, uh, that, that uh, opening or that leak to try to close it up. Uh, so that it doesn't cause a problem. There are issues with device-related thrombosis, and this is very important because I don't think we know for a fact what is the best post-implant drug regimen to reduce the device-related thrombosis. Even though it is an infrequent occurrence, occurring only around 1% to 6% uh, in major clinical trials. Uh, it is a problem because at the end of the day, you are putting this device to eliminate the need of oral anticoagulation. And if you see somebody who that has a clot on top of device, be it like this, or even has an infection and have clots on the device that look like this, then you are committing those patients to longer-term anticoagulation and defeating the the, the, the uh, rationale of putting this device in. And most importantly, there is the problem of device embolization. You want to make sure that when you put the device, that that device does not leave the site that you have implanted it in. And such as you can see here, that device has uh, is attached to the mitral valve. And that is a problem because some of times these will require surgical intervention to uh, get those devices out, although most of them you can remove them percutaneously. Now, hopefully and thankfully enough, these kinds of complications do not occur uh, with a high frequency. They're all less than 2% uh, of the time. But this is something that we need to be aware of when we discuss with our patients, what are the potential problems that we can uh, run into. Now, most of these studies showed that if the device is implanted, 
99% of the patients are able to stop their oral anticoagulation by one year follow-up, which is the intent of why we are putting those devices in, uh, in place. So much so that with the 2019 uh, AHA, ACC, and HRS uh, guidelines for treatment of atrial fibrillation, uh, percutaneous left atrial appendage closure has gained a class 2B indication for patients with atrial fibrillation at an increased risk of stroke who have contraindication to long term anticoagulation. Now, this is kind of a little bit funny because if you look at the studies that were done to lead to the approval of the Watchman device in uh, patients with atrial fibrillation, it was these studies were done in patients who are able to take warfarin, who can take oral anticoagulation. Yet, when the FDA approved it and when the CMS criteria came about, they decided that it is not for everybody yet. It is for patients who are at high risk of stroke, who have recommendation to take oral anticoagulation, but for some reason cannot take long-term oral anticoagulation and therefore they are seeking a rationale to take a non-drug alternative for stroke prevention purposes, and that would be the Watchman device. In addition, the CMS uh, very carefully says that in for us to approve that device, there should be a shared decision-making interaction with a non-implanting physician, with an independent non-interventional physician who has that same discussion with the patient about risk of stroke and risk of bleeding with oral anticoagulation and with the device, and that should be documented in the chart. And also the centers who do these kinds of procedures need to maintain a registry of different variables that are included in that registry to have the ability for long-term tracking of data and the outcome in those patient population. Now, those studies were done in that old generation Watchman device, which we call the Watchman 2.5, which is right here. This is the new Watchman that is called the Watchman Flex device, which has a shallower uh, profile, which is good because one of the problems that we had putting that Watchman device in is that if the left atrial appendage is shallow and not very deep, we are not able to push that device or to uh, deploy that device in that appendage. With this device being shallower, we are able to attack uh, shallower left atrial appendage and therefore treat uh, more patients with difficult left atrial appendage anatomy. And also there are some other enhancements such as that device has more struts around it, so therefore provides better seal and less uh, leakage uh, around the device. Uh, it doesn't have exposed feet. You can put it in a ball formation and therefore safer to move around the left atrium and less uh, pericardial effusion. It has uh, two rows of anchors, which allows it to anchor better to the surrounding tissue, therefore better stability. And it has reduced metal exposure or pro conferring probably a reduced thrombogenicity. So the hope is that this would be a better device in terms of some of the side effects or issues that have been found with the original one. And truly enough, if you look at the most recent study, which is the Pinnacle study that was the first US study to use the Flex device and that led recently to the approval, FDA approval of the Watchman Flex device just recently in July, 2020. That study included 400 patients in a single arm prospective non-randomized study and was able to show that the primary efficacy endpoint, which is um, closure of the left atrial appendage without significant leaks by 12 months is 100% in all patients. The safety endpoint, which is the occurrence of those side effect on complications around the time of the procedure was down to 0.5%. And the implant success rate is 99%. And the device related thrombosis rate is only 1.8%. So those enhancements that this newer device uh, has come up with really translated at least in this uh, limited clinical trial into better outcomes at uh, all levels. So much so that the FDA approved it. And nowadays with the further ongoing clinical trials, the option study that I will talk about and the champion AFib study, the device that is being used is the Watchman Flex. And uh, I don't think um, that uh, this uh, old Watchman 2.5 will be used for uh, a lot of, for a long period of time. Everybody will 
will switch to this is a much better device actually to manipulate and uh, apparently has uh, better results. So who are the patients now that we consider for a Watchman uh, device placement? As I said, these are patients with a high chads vasc score, usually uh, greater than two for men, greater than three for women, who have contraindication to long-term oral anticoagulation. So we see patients who come in with AFib and have had GI bleeding or have had intracranial hemorrhage or uh, uh, have been uh, refractory or poorly compliant to, with oral anticoagulation. We also see patients who have active lifestyle who do not want to be on oral anticoagulation, as well as patients who have had their left atrial appendage ablated and therefore not much contraction there. And these patients are at an increased risk of stroke despite being a normal sinus rhythm. These are the patients now that are indicated for left atrial appendage closure with a Watchman device. So if we go to our case that we uh, talked about in our first slide. That 76-year-old female, because of her comorbidities, has a chads vasc score of seven. She has a has blood score of four by virtue of her age, the fact that she has had bleeding problems. And if you look at this kind of risk profile, you see that a chads vasc score of seven gives you an annual stroke risk of 9.6% per year. And then has blood score of four gives you an 8.9% risk of bleeding on anticoagulation. And that's essentially what we go through when we see patients in our clinic. We tell them and discuss with them the risk of stroke and we kind of compare it to what is the risk of bleeding and decide that a patient like this would be recommended to have a left atrial appendage occlusion. Now you say, well, those patients have had a, a bleeding, either a GI bleeding or, a, or, or an intracerebral bleeding. Now, are we, how are we going to give them oral anticoagulation shortly before and for 45 days after the implant procedure? Aren't we afraid that they're going to bleed during this intermediate or short-term anticoagulation? regulation period of time, when we and other have looked at that potential risk in patients who have had bleeding problems. And we have seen that this short-term anticoagulation regimen that we give around the time of the procedure, obviously under the guidance of the neurologist or the gastroenterologist or what have you, really does not translate or does not lead to major bleeding during that short-term course of oral anticoagulation. There is a study that we did very early on with 20 patients who came in with really bleeding problems, GI bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage, and those patients did well, did not have any problem during that short-term anticoagulation regimen. So much so that it is not just um, uh, the, the EP department or the interventional cardiology section who uh, deal with this kind of a problem. We have created an atrial fibrillation stroke prevention center, kind of a multidisciplinary team, draw in our neurologist colleagues, our gastroenterologist, our urologist, everybody who is involved with the bleeding problem uh, for that specific patient in an effort to streamline the uh, patient's experience as well as uh, the uh, uh, generate uh, good information, quality data to be able to tackle this problem and answer this question uh, more uh, efficiently and uh, carefully. Now, this is our experience, and this is an old slide. Now, we are definitely way more than 500, but this is an old slide. Just to tell you that our patient population in whom we were trying to put those watchman devices in are patients who are at high risk. Their CHADS VAS score are around five, way in excess of what kind of patients were studied in the PREVAIL and the PROTECT AFib. Obviously, because in those prior studies, patients were able to take oral anticoagulation long-term to be part of the study, whereas the patients that we were trying to put the Watchman device in as part of the newer guidelines or FDA approval are sicker patients who cannot take oral anticoagulation for a long time. They have a high chads vasc score. And in those patients, we can see that on follow-up here in red, the risk of stroke was only 2.8% at one year which is far better than if they would have been left alone without oral anticoagulation, 12% um, risk of stroke in a similar patient population with similar chads vasc score without oral anticoagulation, and even better than the patients who would have been on warfarin, which historically have been reported around 4% per year. So clearly the Watchman device is something that is helpful and a good alternative for those patients who have uh, contraindications for long-term oral anticoagulation.
Now, we are talking about stroke prevention and we are talking about patients who have atrial fibrillation. Um, this is a case of a 64-year-old woman who has had symptomatic persistent AFib despite medical therapy, Chad's VASC score of five because she has hypertension, diabetes, and history of TIA. She has had a history of intracranial bleed while taking rivaroxaban, and therefore her HASBAT score is four. And the reason behind that is that she has cavernous malformation, which according to the surgeon, was not amenable to surgical removal. So that patient has been off anticoagulation with a Chad's VAS score of five. And the question is, what do we do in this situation? She clearly has indication for AFib ablation because she has had symptomatic atrial fibrillation despite medical therapy. And she also has an indication for left atrial appendage closure. She has a high Chad's VAS risk and she cannot be on long-term oral anticoagulation because of a history of bleeding. So this is the kind of patient that uh, used to pose some kind of a dilemma for us. What do we do? Do we ablate the atrial fibrillation? And uh, if she has recurrence, put a device in her? Do we put a device in her, then ablate her six months later? Or do we do an ablation for her AFib and implant the device at a later time? Do we send her for surgery for a maze and left atrial appendage clipping, which is obviously uh, uh, an option? Or do we do an AFib ablation and put a watchman device all at the same time? And this is where the one-stop procedure starts making sense. And this patient essentially did have an AFib ablation. And at the same time, since we are in the same neighborhood, we're in the same zip code, uh, we are in the left atrium, we went ahead and put a left atrial, append left atrial closure device with a watchman, such as you can see here. And it is important because if you see, this is the ridge where we do the ablation right over here. And that ridge after the ablation becomes a little bit swollen. Now, fortunately enough in most patients that is a little bit further away from where you put those devices, but definitely that is something to be taken into consideration. And that patient, uh, and follow up, she was atrial fibrillation free on no antiarrhythmic medication. After taking three months of oral anticoagulation, now she's on aspirin alone. She has not had any bleeding events. And if you look at her follow up CT scan here, you can see the watchman device without any contrasts in the left atrial appendage, signifying that there is no leak and there's adequate seal of that uh, left uh, of that watchman for the left atrial uh, appendage. And there is actually some benefit to doing a combined procedure because number one, you're we're doing one procedure instead of two. Um, you are exposing a patient at high risk of bleeding to one time oral anticoagulation rather than twice. It is possibly a lower cost and a more efficient utilization of our healthcare resources. And definitely it is better accepted by patients because they're having one instead of two procedure. But there are certain issues that we need to be aware of because there might be some sizing and stability of the device, especially if you're ablating close to where you're gonna place the device. There are issues with edema, issues with scar formation and whether this is gonna affect the stability of the device on long-term follow-up. Plus, if you put a device there, if you need to do a re ablation down the road, is this going to be in the way of you accessing areas that you want to do an ablation for? But most importantly now, the most impediment to doing a combined procedure is reimbursement. You cannot be reimbursed for two for these two uh, procedures, you get reimbursed for one, and therefore this has been a drawback to doing this, um, this, this kind of a one-stop uh, procedure for combination procedures, but I'm sure that this is going to change down the road. Once we have data to show that this makes sense, it is a lower cost and it has a good safety profile. And this has been done actually around the world. This is from Australia. Karen Phillips used to be one of our fellows and has done that in Australia and has showed that a combined approach results in a high implant success rate with low complication rate and actually makes sense in this uh, situation. This has been our experience. Now, more than 130 patients with combined procedures, an implant success of 98% without significant uh, uh, complication around the implant time. And uh, three quarters of the patients are uh, arrhythmia free, which is pretty much commensurate with what uh, the data for ablation um, uh, goes for. And none of the patients had stroke or major bleeding around the time of the procedure. So, so far we have been talking only about patients who have had 
problems with bleeding. And so far, uh, most of the indications for left atrial appendage closure, at least in the US, is for patients who are at high risk of stroke and have problems taking oral anticoagulation because of bleeding problem. But what we need to figure out is we need to see, do we have the possibility to expand those indications? If the original trial with the PROTECT AFib and the PREVAIL have shown that really the benefit of left atrial appendage closure device is on reducing the long-term bleeding problems that patients on oral anticoagulation have. Therefore, it is not necessarily the high-risk patients of bleeding that, uh, that, that might benefit from this, and maybe other patients um, might benefit from it, those patients who not necessarily have risk of bleeding. So it's an attempt at driving towards a frontline therapy with the use of left atrial appendage uh, closure device. And that's the option in the champion AFib studies that are being uh, currently uh, done. So just two words about the option trial, because I think we are involved in the option trial, and it's a trial that uh, definitely makes perfect sense. The option trial, uh, the rationale for it is that patients who come for an AFib ablation, uh, those patients, we tell them that atrial fibrillation ablation is not a cure. They will continue to have atrial fibrillation, although to a lesser extent. Plus, Patients who come for an AFib ablation usually come back to see us three, four months later and ask us, well, can we stop oral anticoagulation? Uh, we know that up to 40% of patients who undergo ablation think that that's the you know, that's going to be the cure, and they go ahead and they stop their oral anticoagulation themselves. But we do not have really any randomized clinical trial that tell us that it's safe to stop oral anticoagulation in patients uh, post-ablation who have a high risk of stroke based on their chads vas score. That doesn't exist. We don't have any data to tell us that AFib ablation reduces the risk of uh, stroke in patients uh, with a high chads vas score. We do not have that randomized clinical trial to tell us this. Most importantly, I think that we are now trying to understand the model differently. And it's not like atrial fibrillation causes stroke directly, but rather that there is an atrial myopathy that predisposes patients to have a stroke and at the same time predisposes patients to have atrial fibrillation. Obviously, the presence of AFib increases the risk of stroke, but you do not necessarily need to have ongoing AFib to have a high risk of stroke. So as if these are two phenotypes of the same disease, and therefore, even if you get rid of the atrial fibrillation, you might not reduce significantly the risk of stroke, and therefore, you still need to have some kind of protection going forward. And with this in mind, the option study will take patients who have non-valvular atrial fibrillation, and these patients are either are going to go for an AFib ablation or recently have had an AFib ablation. And those patients, if their chads vas score is more than two in men or more than three in women, by guidelines, these patients need to continue on oral anticoagulation. So what the study is going to do is going to take those patients and randomizes them to either continuation of oral anticoagulation or watchman device placement. And that device placement can happen either at the same time of doing the ablation concomitant or in a sequential fashion, meaning that the patient gets the ablation and three to six months later gets implanted with the watchman device. And those patients will be followed up for three years, looking at the co-primary endpoint of uh, death stroke or systemic embolization, the non-inferiority, uh, criterion or major non-procedural bleeding as a superiority criterion. And those patients will take three months of oral anticoagulation post-implant followed after three months by aspirin alone. So a simplified regimen, Plavix is not involved. And then we will see what the results of this study are going to show. The champion AFib study is actually taking the same kind of protocol, but not only to the AFib ablation patients, to all comers with atrial fibrillation with a CHADS VAS score more than two and uh, in women CHADS VAS score more than three. And the difference between this and the prior study is that those, uh, the, those patients uh, will be randomized one-to-one 
Watchman Flex, so this is the new Watchman, and not Warfarin, but the newer oral anticoagulation, because we know that the newer anticoagulation compared to Warfarin have a better uh, profile in terms of risk of bleeding. So that's going to be a tighter comparison, because if you remember with the previous studies, the benefit of the Watchman came from the fact that it reduces the risk of bleeding and therefore reduces the risk of stroke. So now that we're using something that is better than warfarin, is that difference going to hold in this study? And this is what we're going to try to find out, because if this study is positive, meaning that if we know that the Watchman Flex compared to newer oral anticoagulant is better for mortality, long-term risk of bleeding, and has the same effectiveness as the reduction in risk of ischemic stroke, then that surely will take and put the left atrial appendage closure device as a front line in terms of treatment of these patients. So this study is going to involve 3,000 patients and is going to run for five years. And I think that if there's going to be a benefit for left atrial appendage closure device, it's going to be even beyond five years because it's of the compounded risk of bleeding that we have with oral anticoagulation. So we're very excited to see if this is going to be the case. Now, obviously, there are some other ongoing trials that are going to be going on in all different kinds of subtypes of patients. The catalyst study is the same as the champion AFib study, but Instead of the watchman, uh, there the use the device there is going to be the amulet from Abbott. This is not yet approved in the U.S., but that's going to be a study that uh, will lead to that. Uh, there is the closure AFib study, which will be enrolling patients with history of major bleeds and randomizing them to either device or continuation of oral anticoagulant. There is the occlusion AFib study, which is enrolling patients with recent ischemic strokes to device versus oral anticoagulant. And there is also the stroke closed study, which is enrolling patients with intracerebral hemorrhage recent within six months and seeing if those patients will benefit from um, a watchman device as opposed to continuation of oral anticoagulation. So there are clearly lots of unanswered issues when it comes to left atrial appendage closure device. Um, we don't know what is the best uh, oral anticoagulation regimen to give patients immediately after implant. Do we give them just oral anticoagulation for 45 days and then aspirin? Or do we need dual antiplatelet therapy and then aspirin? Or is there room for low dose oral anticoagulation longer term? We don't know that. What is the best imaging modality to follow up these patients with? Is it TEE at 45 days? Is it CT scan? Do we do it at 45 days? Do we do it at three months? When is the best time to find device related thrombosis? We do not know. There are high-risk patients, such as I discussed, the patients with recent intracerebral hemorrhage, recent stroke, patients at high risk of bleeding, patients with chronic kidney disease. All these patients uh, need to, a subgroup of patients need to be studied to see if the benefit of the left atrial appendage closure devices hold in that patients, as well as there are lots of procedural issues. And as you can see, there are lots of clinical trials, and I'm putting the slides just to emphasize that this is really a very hot subject and lots of clinical trials around the world are being done to try to address these issues and answer these questions. So in conclusion, yes, there are advantages for the closure device. Uh, there's a high implant success. It is safe. It is effective. There's no need to monitor levels or INR. There are no concerns about patient compliance, no worries about drug interactions, no dietary restrictions. There's a low risk of intracerebral or major bleeding. Actually, that's the benefit of the device. There is a mortality benefit, and there is no worries about interrupting medication. So it's like like the usual old dictum, you set it and you forget it. So the left atrial appendage occlusion is a very promising strategy to reduce the risk of stroke without the bleeding risk associated with long-term anticoagulation. But does this hold true in the general population of patients with atrial fibrillation without risk of bleeding? And that's what we're going to find out. And we're awaiting the results of newer clinical trials over the next few years. And we're very excited about what the uh, future of this technology will be. And I'm going to stop here and take it for question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. At this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC Cardiac Electrophysiology, I'd like to introduce Frank Vermeeren, Director of Accreditation, 
and Sandy DePetris, our Senior Clinical Specialist. They'll be assisting with the Q&A session today. Frank, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Kelly and uh, Dr. Saliba. Thank you very much. This was an excellent presentation, and uh, the questions are equally um, as, uh, as profound as what your comments were. So uh, I want to start out with the first question, and uh, you did cover this. However, I think it's important to review it as it, uh, the question has shown up a few times. Um, would you mind please uh, commenting on the five millimeter cutoff for residual leaks? Sorry. Residual leaks regarding the need for um, oral coagulation. Sure. So there's nothing magic about uh, five millimeter or two millimeters or what have you. Um, but uh, um, when those studies were uh, initially designed, they had to come up with a cutoff point to say yes, this is adequately closed, and no, this is not adequately closed. And they come up with a five millimeter just because if you have a clot, uh, maybe if the clot is uh, um, a, a clot that would be big enough uh, to result in a stroke would be probably around four or five millimeter. And this is where come, they came up with this five millimeter uh, measurement. Now, there is um, there has been publication uh, looking at validation that, yes, a five milli, more than five milliliter um, uh, leak detected by TEE uh, might be associated with a higher risk of stroke. But more importantly, is that if you have a leak that is less than five millimeter, uh, they have not seen a significant increase in the risk of stroke in those patients, even though anticoagulation have been stopped. In practice, and that is because we don't know, not because we know, in practice, if the leak is more than five millimeter by TEE, then we tend to continue oral anticoagulation, obviously keeping in mind that you have to weigh what is the risk of continuing anticoagulation versus the risk of a stroke in that patient uh, and making the decision accordingly. Now, if you look at the, um, the, the detection of leaks by CT scan, well, the CT scan tends to actually find more leaks than, uh, than TEE, uh, and the size of those leaks have not been adjudicated as to what you consider is significant or not. But one of the studies that I showed at the very end is looking at what is the best imaging and the timing of those imaging to try to see what is the significance of those leaks. And, and maybe looking at real-world data will allow us to uh, see exactly if we believe what the real world data tells us, because there are some deficiencies, obviously, in reporting what this, what the significance of these leaks would be going forward. Thank you. Um, Dr. Saliba, uh, the question came through, why do some patients develop a pericardial effusion from the closure device? And in follow-up to that, how often should you echo either transthoracic or TEE post-implant for effusion? So obviously, the pericardial effusion can happen because of the procedure immediately, like during your transeptal puncture or uh, if, uh, if manipulation of the device in the left atrial appendage uh, is a little bit traumatic, uh, that can result in pericardial effusion uh, during the procedure or at the time of the procedure. Uh, there is also uh, something uh, that has been noted uh, commonly called as delayed pericardial effusion that can happen, say, before the patient gets discharged or within the first week or what have you. Um, and that can uh, occur uh, because uh, it is believed that uh, some of those small anchors that um, the device uh, uses to uh, have good stability, uh, it, that can erode a little bit and uh, can causes some pericardial irritation and result in slowly accumulating uh, effusion. Um, that the, the occurrence of these effusions, not the periprocedural. The periprocedural, you're there, you see it, uh, you do whatever needs to be done to remedy the situation. Uh, but the delayed effusion, these don't tend to be life-threatening because they are small ooze or small pro or um, uh, slowly uh, growing. Um, and then we alert the patients. They don't happen frequently. Um, there happen less than 1% of the cases, uh, and uh, 
uh, if this, we alert the patients that if they have obviously problems with chest pain or problems with worsening shortness of breath or uh, they get dizzy, then these symptoms should prompt them to seek medical attention. And, you know, if you have, if we have any new symptoms post uh, implant, obviously the threshold to get an echocardiogram is very low. Great. Um, thank you. And uh, we had a question regarding, uh, it says basically if these patients are going to be on lifelong aspirin post-closure, would their bleeding risk still be high given the results of the Averroes trial? Yeah, that is a very good question. And that falls into that uh, issue that I talked about. What is the best uh, post-drug, post-implant drug regimen? The only reason that aspirin is there uh, long-term is not because aspirin has been shown to be effective. Uh, it's just there because uh, uh, whenever you have a foreign body implanted uh, uh, in the heart, everybody is concerned about the risk of thrombosis and everybody wants to put something. But uh, I, I would definitely agree that aspirin uh, has uh, an underestimated risk of bleeding and that needs to be taken into consideration. And if you give aspirin long term, it might potentially negate some of the benefit that a watchman device uh, or uh, any appendage occlusion device uh, may have on the long term. Um, but until we have data that tell us that there is adequate endothelialization of the device by, say, a year or by two years, and therefore this is when you can stop even single antiplatelet therapy, I don't think uh, people are going to be very uh, uh, comfortable stopping such therapy. Now, the newer, if you notice that the newer um, clinical trials, uh, the long-term aspirin recommendation has been replaced by at the doctor's discretion because of this issue that we are talking about. So this is a very good question, and I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> Um, here's another question. Can we use a shallow, newer device for larger and deeper left atrial appendage? And uh, as an aside to that, for patients' status post-ablation, would putting a metal device make a patient more prone to thrombus, thrombus formation? So uh, it's a two-part question. The first part is, can we use a shallow device in a uh, patient who have uh, deep appendages? Yes, as long as uh, the anatomy is suitable and uh, you have what we call the PASS criteria after implant, that is not a problem. Uh, but you have to be obviously um, uh, uh, careful uh, if you are doing an ablation that the device landing area is not at the same place where you have done the ablation because that can be an issue in terms of stability down the road. Now, when it comes to thrombosis, uh, th there is a concern uh, that uh, you just had an ablation and now you're putting a foreign body. Is this going to be an issue? Um, and this is why for patients who have had a combined procedure, the duration of oral anticoagulation has been extended from 45 days to three months, which is the standard for patients who have had an ablation anyway. Um, and so far, the clinical trials, and not the randomized, the clinical trials, because there's no randomized uh, trial on concomitant procedure, except the first trial is that option trial, which is going to be the first and the largest randomized clinical trial of AFib ablation. And in this trial, there is uh, an arm or a subarm that looks at the concomitant procedure. But in the clinical uh, case studies, case series, and uh, the retrospective analysis, there has not been an increased risk of thrombosis or stroke formation doing a combined procedure. Thank you. Uh, we've had several questions, and it was really in regards to the longevity of the device itself. So they asked questions like, how long would the device last? And was a lifetime expectation for the device once it's placed? Well, again, this started back in 2002. So this is how much data we have so far, a little bit less than 10 years. Um, and those devices are supposed to uh, last for a long time in terms of, I mean, they go to the grave with the patient eventually, uh, as far as we would know. The only devices that were removed 
are devices that were infected, which is very rare, but we've had a, a case uh, that was placed in Germany and the patient came in here with a device infection. That's the uh, picture that I showed you about with those vegetations floating on the back of the device and that device had to be removed along with the left atrial appendage surgically to treat the infection. Um, um, and there has been very few devices removed at the time of surgery because uh, the, the, the surgeon went in, wanted to replace a valve, and the device was either in the way or what have you. So they just clipped the left atrial appendage along with the device and they oversaw it. Although I can tell you some of my patients who had a device who went for surgery, the surgeons left them alone. Interesting. Um, one question came in kind of related to this. Is this left atrial, left atrial appendage device safe to put in patients with prosthetic valves? Well, remember, we are talking about non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So that's very important to know that. And non-valvular atrial fibrillation uh, essentially excludes patients with prosthetic valves as well as patients with mitral stenosis. So this, whatever we've talked about today, does not hold for those patients. Now, if it's a bioprosthetic mitral valve, yes, no problem. Hmm. Great. Uh, this question is, uh, what shoulder is acceptable when doing a Watchman deployment? So this has not been looked at systematically, especially uh, we're talking about the Watchman device because that's the kind of device that would have a shoulder. Um, so this has not been um, uh, looked at systematically and there has been some claims that if you have a, a large shoulder, you might delay endothelialization of uh, the device and therefore you might need longer anticoagulation. I don't think the shoulders are that much important or that much of a problem as long as the device is stable and as long as the fabric around the back of the device and around the shoulder uh, does not allow any, uh, that shoulder is not long, large enough to have and provide leakage from around it to the outside. So if that is not a problem, then the shoulder is not an issue, I think. Uh, now, remember, sometimes the device wiggles around and finds a fine and sets in a slightly different <coughs> position than the first initial implant. And that's what we have found sometimes on TEE. So how much shoulder you allow at the time of implant uh, can affect how much shoulder you're going to end up at 45 days. So we tend to try to minimize that as much as possible just because of the issue that it might increase uh, the percentage of leakage uh, at follow-up. Hmm. Another question about the actual device. Is it MRI safe after yes. implant? That is good. That is a good question. It's not a it's not, it's not a ferromagnetic device. So yes, it is. It's not a, it's not an issue with MRI. Great. And this is also regarding imaging. Uh, this actually, I'm going to ask maybe a three part question here. Is one does every Watchman patient get in post, an echo post procedure, and can it be done by transthoracic versus TEE? And how often would you recommend that they do an echo for um, after this procedure? So it's a good question from the standpoint that everything is mandated, uh, meaning that um, once you uh, put a Watchman device, uh, the current protocol and the current mandate is uh, that you get a TE at 45 days because this is when you decide uh, based on if the device has a good seal and there are no clots on the device, this is when you decide that, okay, now we can stop oral anticoagulation and give you Plavix. Uh, the FDA has mandated that you have another TEE done at one year, which is a little bit different now with the COVID situation. It's been, a, it's been an issue. Um, now, how often you don't need to do more than that, except if the patient, say, comes in with a stroke or with a new problems that would warrant doing a TEE or they come up for an ablation and you do a TEE and you find an incidental finding there. Now, the day... What, what has been found is that when you do a 45-day uh, TEE uh, in those patients, all the device-related thrombosis that were detected in the patients, say in that pinnacle study, uh, the 400 patients with Watchman Flex, all the device-related thrombosis were not found at the time of the 45-day, 
but they were found actually after 45 days when the patients were on dual antiplatelet therapy. So it makes the TEE at 45 days a moot point. Why do you want to do it if it's not showing anything? So why don't you switch the patients to whatever you want to switch them from oral anticoagulation to dual antiplatelet therapy, then mandate doing a TEE one or two months later. This is why in the CHAMPION study that uh, is currently undergoing under um, you see that the TEE mandate to do after implant is not at three is not at three months. It's not at the time that you're going to stop the oral anticoagulation, but it's actually at four or five months after you stop the oral anticoagulation and you put the patient on aspirin. And I'm sorry, the last part of that was: Do you do one like immediately after, like the next day? Uh, just no. To check your, okay. no, 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 not unless there is a problem or you suspect a problem. Otherwise, if the patient at the time of the procedure, obviously you do TEE after you release the device and things are okay, then you don't do that. Uh, if there is a problem, then, you know, it will, uh, you, you'll do uh, an echo. Otherwise, you don't. Thank you. There have been a couple questions come by. What if the patient is allergic to aspirin? Well, if the person is allergic to aspirin, you do the same thing that what the interventional cardiologists do, then you give them Plavix. But the question is, how long do you give them Plavix? And I don't think that this has been even uh, addressed in this context. You give them, now we give patients Plavix and aspirin for six months after we, we, we switch them from oral anticoagulation. Um, beyond six months, as I said uh, initially, we don't have any data about the role of antiplatelet therapy and whether the patient needs to be on antiplatelet therapy. In clinical practice, if I'm the doctor uh, taking care of that patient and assuming that the patient doesn't have a very high risk of bleeding, I would probably continue Plavix for a year and then stop stop it altogether. So that would be a possibility, assuming that by then there is good endothelialization of the device and you don't need to worry about it anymore. Similar to, say, what you do with stents. Okay, great. Uh, this question has to do um, really with kind of the surgical approach versus the Watchman device uh, because of considering the long-term anticoagulation factor. So how, how safe is it to remove the left atrial appendage versus dealing with the anticoagulation with Watchman device, is it? And, and would you use one? When do you prefer one over the other? The surgical versus the Watchman versus the percutaneous? Correct. So obviously, if the patient is going for surgery for, for one reason or another, be it for valve surgery or for uh, bypass surgery, um, or even for obviously maze, uh, then if they have an indication, uh, if they have uh, atrial fibrillation, I can tell you that now at least our surgeons, and I'm sure that this is the practice uh, in most places, uh, patient going for surgery has atrial fibrillation, uh, they will take out the left atrial appendage. So the, 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 the problem with the surgical issue is, as I said at the beginning, is, is the following. The surgeons have removed the appendages for the past, uh, I don't know, more than 20 years. The problem is that nobody has kept data and nobody has kept outcome. Otherwise, that would have been a wealth of information. They did such a lousy job with follow-up. On, on, on not from the surgical side, but from the left atrial appendage side in terms of whether they had a stroke, whether they had bleeding, whether they had atrial fibrillation. And therefore, we lost all that information. And they, it's not up until this past few years that the surgeons now are doing a randomized clinical trial to see if surgical closure or surgical exclusion of the left atrial appendage, uh, number one, is safe, and number two, is it effective uh, in terms of reducing the risk of stroke. Because you can say, well, of course, if we're removing the left atrial appendage or if we're closing it, it should have the same kind of impact. But there are a lot of things in medicine and in the human body whereby these kinds of extrapolation have been very disappointing. Great. Uh, well, one of the, th I'm sorry, I just have one more thing to say. Um, there was a question earlier and they asked um, if you wouldn't mind, please, uh, reviewing your uh, disclaimers. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed if that. You had, if you had anything to uh, disclose. Disclose, uh -huh. Oh, of course. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, conflict of interest. Uh, I should have said that at the beginning. I'm sorry. So um, I am on the advisory board for uh, Biosense Webster, for Boston Scientific. I did receive uh, um, um, compensation uh, for uh, speakers' engagement uh, from, from Abbott, uh, from Biosense, and uh, from Boston Scientific. Thank you. Sure. 
And I, I think maybe at this point, uh, since we're so close to finishing here, I'll turn it back over to Kelly. So thank you very much, Dr. Saliba. Appreciate your- Sure, it's a pleasure. Thanks again, everyone. And a very special thank you to Dr. Saliba for his presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, LAA Closure, Addressing the Unmet Needs for AF Patients. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and anytime thereafter through the CE transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.